morning. It's um, 12.30, so it's uh, about time to start uh, this section that I'm sharing. I'm Antonio Branco. And this session is about annotation and acquisition tools. Uh, it is organized into two groups of three presentations. We'll have a first group of three presentations, then a break or better, um, <clears throat> an, a Q&A session of 10 minutes, and then again, a second group of three talks. So let's move right away for the first group of talks. And um, I will give the floor, yeah, to the first one about the uh, corporate for abstractive uh, text summarization, please. Thank you. Uh, so, in our paper, we present a method uh, for building corpora to be used for training and testing abstractive summarizers. And next slide, please. Uh, from a large corpus of almost 2 million Swedish news articles, uh, we used a number of filtering techniques to achieve properties similar to, to the popular CNN Daily Mail corpus in English. Uh, and we, what we did was to fine tune an encoder decoder model uh, based on Swedish BERT. Uh, and we did this on four differently filtered corpora. And these models were then evaluated on two test sets. Uh, one was more filtered than the other. And we showed that using a highly filtered corpus for training and testing gives uh, better results, uh, which is almost on par with the results on the CNN Taylor Mail corpus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the most important factor in achieving high evaluation scores uh, was to have a highly filtered test set. Uh, and the highest evaluation scores were achieved when training on a relatively small corpus, uh, but highly filtered one as well. Um, and this highlights the importance of having high quality test data uh, during evaluation and that more training data does not necessarily produce a better model if the data is of uh, lower quality. Um, and on the other hand, the, fine, the model fine-tuned on the less filtered corpus performed uh, better on the less filtered test data as well, uh, although with much lower evaluation scores. And we believe that this is because it can generalize better to many kinds of examples, even those that are of lower quality. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we filtered the original uh, corpus in two stages. Uh, firstly, we filtered based on article and summary length. Uh, so articles uh, shorter than 25 words and uh, summaries shorter than 10 words were removed. Uh, and, uh, and we also filtered on compression ratio. Uh, um, yeah, which is like the summary length divided by article length. Um, and this uh, initial filtering and the removal of duplicates gave us a corpus of uh, about 800,000 uh, examples. We call this the TNLC corpus. Uh, it is also worth noting that we use the preamble as a summary and uh, that the preamble was not always a good summary of an article. And uh, as can be seen in the table, uh, the NLC has much higher novelty, which is a measure of abstractness in the summary, uh, and contains less semantically similar articles and summaries. And this indicates and points to the problem of uh, low quality data. Next slide, please. Uh, secondly, we further filtered uh, the NLC with thresholds on novelty and semantic similarity. And novelty, as I mentioned, uh, was calculated as the fraction of n-grams in the summary that was not in the paired, paired article. Uh, and semantic similarity was uh, calculated as the cosine similarity between embedding representations uh, for the two texts. So the n, as you can see here in the table, the ns uh, was filtered on semantic similarity, n on novelty, and sn on both. Um, and you can see that the highly filtered corpus uh, gets closer to the characteristics of the CNN daily mail corpus. And uh, certain filtering techniques has been deployed for similar purposes before as well. 
uh, for example, the MLSAM corpus. Excuse me, you uh, need to have to stop, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not yet right now, or can I wrap up? Yeah, the... two sentences more, please. Yeah, okay. So go to my next slide and I'll just conclude. And yeah, and we believe that the presented method can be uh, used to build high quality corpora when you have data similar to the DN corpus with many low quality examples and yeah we will uh, this present this as a resource as well that will be free later. all right thank you thank you so much julius let's move right away to the next talk about labeling a danish corpus please next one yes, yes. <laughs> thank you um so we three uh, 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 me and daughter and costanza uh, worked on the danish declaring DK uh, project for in parliament uh, for parliament and uh, this talk is about the technical uh, implementation of this uh, work next slide please so our task was that we we started uh, with uh, already uh, t5 tp5 encoded uh, input so one of one of us uh, had uh, made all the metadata in the in the in these ti files and uh, there were um uh, there was there was mainly text in uh, and that we had to do that was add um, uh, named entities more for syntactic descriptions lemmas and dependency structures and everywhere we had to follow this parliament ti p5 annotation schema next slide please so um, the solution we used was to, to use the text sensorium, which um, uh, to recap is a workflow manager that automatically computes candidate workflows. Um, and uh, it can handle many formats. Tool integration is done uh, by wrapping the tools in PHP code. And so they, they run as uh, web services and um, uh, uh, annotations can be in in, 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 uh, in separate files or it can be inline. Um, and uh, th this text sensorium handles very many languages uh, and for Danish even three time periods, uh, medieval and uh, uh, late modern and contemporary. And it is open source and it runs on a, on, on, on a laptop, uh, but also on, on servers, and you can access it via clear and DK. Uh, the last line on this uh, sheet. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so we had to make some adaptions at, uh, to this text sensorium. Uh, so extend the capabilities of the text sensorium, not, not change it for, for good. Um, uh, we had to to add a capability to handle the TI P5 to two of the tools, the, 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 the named entity recognizer and the, and the UD pipe uh, uh, tool. Um, and uh, we also wanted to see, to have a graphical uh, presentation of the output of the workflow. So we could make some checks. Um, so we added two tools to do that. Uh, the segmentation tokenization, which is always a very hard problem, uh, was improved. Um, so now we um, have fewer errors when 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 encountering uh, 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 abbreviations and uh, um, and the multi-character initials. Um, they were often. Uh, they were typically uh, interpreted as the end of the sentence, the the, the, the period, uh, the period uh, after the initial. So that's that's uh, solved now. Um, and we saw that the UD pipe uh, tool um, produced low quality lemmas. So we had to replace them by uh, other lemmas produced by our lemmatizer. And uh, to that lemmatizer, we had to uh, add the, the capability to handle universal part of speech tags. And um, uh, the named entity recognizer was, uh, we, we made sure that, that that this recognizer know, knew all the names Excuse of them. Excuse me, Mark, you have, you have to close. Two sentences okay, more, okay. Please. Yes, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is the last slide. Um, 
we um, we we had very few errors uh, since the segmentations for errors there were only two of uh, so one percent. Uh, there were many. There were well, there were quite a lot of part of speech text errors made by the UD pipe software, and uh, uh, and as a consequence of that, also lemmas, uh, lemma errors. But uh, but otherwise, uh, 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 it was it was not so bad, um, and then. Um, there were uh, there were there were four, only four named entity recognition errors. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, we move for, to the third and last one in this group. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Soden, and I will be presenting how we created an Icelandic error corpus. Uh, next next slide, please. So the paper describes how we created the Icelandic error corpus, uh, which is a corpus consisting of modern Icelandic text with roughly 57,000 categorized error instances. Um, there are three text genres in the corpus and it is published under an open source uh, CC by four license at the Icelandic Klarin repository. And this project was a part of the Icelandic language technology program, which will be discussed further um, later today. Um, and this error corpus was created in order to guide the development of an open source Icelandic spell and grammar checker uh, called Greiner Correct. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, the corpus consists of three text sources and they were all chosen to reflect different styles of writing. Um, the sources are student essays, online news, and then Wikipedia articles. Uh, the essays are written by students 16 to 20 years old, and sentences within each file have been shuffled to comply with the original license. The online news were written between 2004 and 2014, and they were selected randomly. And the Wikipedia articles aren't dated, but they were also selected randomly. And all of these texts were accessible because uh, they had been published as part of the Icelandic GigaWord corpus. And they are published anonymously in the error corpus. Next slide, please. So the annotation process consists of five steps and they result in an augmented TAE format XML document. The first step is text cleanup where the XML files of the GigaWord corpus are converted to text files. Then they are uh, manually proofread and then converted to TA format XML documents. And in those documents, um, all the corrections are explicitly marked using a revision span. So the fourth step is manual error label labeling where each error is assigned an error code and the annotators working on this step were separate to the proofreaders in step two. Um, and then the fifth and final step is format checking, where we make sure that the XML structure of all files is readable and that all error codes belong to the annotation scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So the annotation scheme used to mark errors in the corpus is a descriptive scheme uh, specifically created for this error corpus. It consists of three hierarchical levels, main categories, which are six, subcategories, which are 31, and then error codes, which are 253 in total. And the lowest level error codes is the one used during annotation, but the middle level, the subcategories, they reflect error types in general. For example, agreement errors, typographical errors, and um, others. And this annotation scheme was revised throughout annotation so that it would be as refined as possible. Uh, for example, removing any redundant error, error codes. Uh, next slide, please. Here we see some st statistical information on the Icelandic error corpus. As you can see from the table, it's split up into a development corpus and a test corpus. And this was done to guide the development of the spell and grabber checker. Uh, the corpus consists of 4,044 files, 
with 56,794 categorized error instances. And there are 45.76 errors per 1,000 words in the corpus uh, in total. But as you can see in the rightmost column, uh, that, that number fluctuates. And there you can also see the five most common subcategories. So next slide, please. Uh, to conclude, we created the Icelandic Error Corpus, which is published open source on Clarin. Uh, it consists of roughly 57,000 errors, and it's annotated according to the three-level le hierarchical annotation scheme. Uh, the text sources are three, and the motivation for creating this corpus uh, was to improve the open source Icelandic spell and grammar checker, Greiner Correct. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for your presentation. All right, so now we enter a 10 minute uh, uh, period for question and answering uh, and answers to these three papers. Um, we had the first paper on the corpus for uh, extractive summaries, uh, uh, sorry, abstractive summaries, which clearly are other than the extractive ones. And obviously corpora for these are much, much welcome. But uh, one question I will have is, uh, what exactly is the filtering methods that you use? Since the, the main uh, result or takeaway you, you, you stress is that filtered um, data sets uh, uh, support uh, better results. With respect to the second, so I, I'm just lining up a, a few questions to give uh, time to our participants to put some questions themselves in the chat screen, okay? So let me open this for myself. All right. Uh, with regards to the second presentation about labeling a, a Danish corpus, um, <clears throat> uh, you report about several levels, very interesting uh, levels of in linguistic annotation. Uh, and my question would be uh, if you could stress uh, key or main takeaways from, from your work and the uh, the exercise you you uh, undertook. With respect to the last one, the third, uh, con concerning an error corpus for ice learning, we know that error corpus are scarce and also much welcome. And again, my question would be what uh, could be for the other participants here in our conference, the lessons um, learned and the key lessons learned and that you can pass to others who may want to uh, develop a similar corpus, okay? So maybe uh, while I, I check the, uh, the chat, you can uh, respond to my questions in this order, please. Yeah, so I can start with the question regarding uh, the filters and the abstractive summarization. And uh, yeah, as I understood it correctly, the filters were uh, based on novelty, uh, which was a measure for how abstract the summary was in relation to the article. Uh, so higher novelty meant a more abstract summary and yeah, lower quality, basically, because the summary could have been uh, not summarizing the article, basically. And uh, then there was semantic similarity. Uh, and there we just took the text, summary text and the article text and uh, compared uh, or measured the similarity between their embeddings. So those two were the two filters we used. But you mentioned different, different uh, levels of or intensity of filtering. Uh, could you say a few words about that? Um, yeah, so I mean, you could set like the the thresholds differently uh, for both novelty and the other filters as well. Uh, so we looked at the CNN Daily Mail corpus uh, regards with regards to those uh, properties and uh, tried to assimilate that to onto our corpus as well. So we adjusted the, the thresholds on novelty and semantic similarity to achieve similar values as the CNN. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Um, 
Bart, please. So my takeaways takeaways are that uh, we had a flying start by by uh, by using the, the text consortium. Um, uh, we could uh, we had we didn't have to design a workflow. We just had to make sure that the tools were were there, and uh, we started with um, not uh, um, not annotating the named entities. But then we uh, uh, didn't. We had a lot of time uh, to spend when we had done that. So we added the named entities uh, afterwards. Um, so that's that's um, that's one thing. The flying start. The, the the other thing is that it was very easy to to um, to repeat all the annotations. We had to do that quite a few times because we discovered. Uh, irritating errors in the in the tokenization, for example, or in, in the named entity recognition. Um, so we we did many um, um, re annotations of, of everything, and this was this 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 happened very fast. Uh, as I said, this, these tools are uh, web applications, and um, they can um, often run in parallel. So in during one night we could uh, we could annotate all our uh, more than six, 600 uh, texts so that, i think that that was the main that's right. what i mean all yeah right. thank you so much thank you uh don can you take the photo now? yes hi i see that there are two questions in the chat um, yeah you can can go right away for them if you okay want. okay thank you so first, um, the first question is um, asking if we considered using any existing error annotation scheme, which we did, but we decided that um, uh, it wouldn't help us that much. It would be better just to create our own, which would, re would reflect the error corpus completely. Um, also, it would have been, it would have had to be um, similar or a language similar to Icelandic. Um, so we just decided to create our own, but we did also look into some other ones, how they were, um, for example, the hierarchical scheme. We decided that that would be a good solution so that we could have very precise error codes and then a middle level, which is a bit more um, descriptive maybe. And yeah, so we decided that it would be better just to create our own annotation scheme. Um, the second question was, uh, whether the error ratio ratio was a surprise. So yeah, it's about 47 errors per 1000 words actually. So it's not very high and maybe we uh, expected it to be a bit higher. We also see that um, we have created specialized error corpora, which are written by, for example, dyslexics and L2 speakers. And the error ratio there is much higher which obviously makes sense, but there we can kind of see the difference in uh, the text written by those different speakers. So, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Dorum. We have one more minute. I think uh, that's time, uh, perhaps enough for Julius to uh, come back to the floor and uh, try to answer this question by Maria Santini. If you can see it in the chat, can you? Yeah, Maybe? I can see it. All right. Uh, so yeah, I would say that in our case, uh, where we had a lot of like pre summaries and that did not actually summarize the articles because there were a lot of like, uh, yeah, introductory talk and uh, sometimes the summary was about something else, basically. <laughs> so in that case, novelty uh, would be noise, you can say. But uh, not always. I mean, the novelty uh, occurs in all, all examples as well, but to a low, lower degree. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much, Julius. And thank you so much to every one of you that uh, contributed to this uh, session and to uh, answer to the questions of uh, uh, coming from the audience and from myself. Uh, let's move then to the second part of this session uh, with the second group of three talks. The next one is uh, about um, 
the evaluation of automatic uh, annotation. Please, Elena. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this talk will be about reliability of automatic linguistic annotation and uh, the examples will be taken from native and non-native te texts. This work has been done in a group of five people, myself, David Elfter, Therese lindstrom Tideman, Maisa Lauriada and Daniela P. Ponan, both in Finland and in Sweden. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we all know, we are just, I suppose, that we all are working with some kind of language data and language data is pre-processed automatically. And we usually work with uh, some kind of error rate that we can accept. But when we work with non-standard language, like for example, second language uh, writing, uh, we want to know to which, uh, to which degree this error rate um, increases. So in this uh, project that we have been working on uh, about development of lexical and grammatical competences in immigrant Swedish, we wanted to kind of ge generalize about what learners learn at different levels of development and how um, they learn the things, grammar, vocabulary, morphology. Um, and we kind of, since we are doing this for, to make some kind of scientific generalizations, we wanted to know to which degree these are correct ones. So to, to kind of to give us a, kind of a ground to that, we performed an annotation check of the data. Uh, please, next slide. So here you can see that this is what we are going to release to, 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 to the uh, audience, to, to the users, lexical profile, grammatical profile and morphological profile for second language Swedish. And we want you, you the users, to know whether this is a reliable kind of type of uh, description of the language development or not. Next slide, please. So what we did, we took three types of data, um, course book texts, learner essays and corrected versions of the learner texts that we have corrected ourselves and we took three texts per proficiency level uh, we have all those this data uh, annotated to, uh, with uh, CIFA level common european framework of reference proficiency level in terms of a1 a2 b1 b2 c1 levels we do not have c2 the last level that um, CIFA defines so we had 15 texts per data set uh, with three texts per proficiency level. Two annotators went through those texts, through an automatic annotation of those texts, and introduced corrections or comments where they considered that the pipeline made a, an error. So they looked into five dimensions. It was lemmatization, part of speech tagging, multi-word expression detection, and a word sense, sense disambiguation and dependency parsing. Next slide, please. Our hypothesis was in general that we kind of expected that pipelines that have been trained on the mother tongue writings uh, would not perform as well on second language writings. And I think it's kind of, it's, it can be generalized from Swedish to other languages as well, uh, the results of our work. And the second hypothesis was that normalization of non-standard language through error correction would improve uh, automatic uh, pipeline performance. Uh, as you can see here in the table, we have a few uh, numbers about uh, how lemmatization, part of speech tagging and dependency relation, uh, how, how numbers or accuracy looks in those different uh, uh, data sets. And you can see that in the mother tongue writings that you see L1 cocktail, that's the data set for corporate cor course book texts, uh, that we have a rather high uh, level of um, accuracy and normalized second language uh, data also before kind of uh, shows that the um, annotation, uh, automatic annotation is rather high. The original uh, second language essays were a little bit lower, though not as much as we have feared. We, we were kind of expecting to have many more errors due to um, misspellings or uh, erroneous morphological inflections or uh, compounding problems. Part of speech tagging was also pretty high, it, it kind of was surprisingly high. Uh, you can see that first language uh, data was 98% correct. Um, the normalized data was close to it and very little drop was in the learner essays. Dependency relations on, this other on the other hand was not performing well. Uh, it was uh, not well good in mother tongue writings. Anyway, it was even worse in um, learner essays. 
another table shows you how it was in multi-word expressions and uh, word sense disambiguation. Uh, in multi-word expressions, if you look at F1... Milena, can, can you come to the conclusion, please? Absolutely, uh, we can go... Sorry. Right, next slide, please. So, uh, to, to, to come to conclusions, if whether we consider this reliable or not to use the automatic annotation, yes, full automatization, part of speech tagging, word sense disambiguation, multi-word expression detection, it was good, but not as good for dependency relation. And as for our hypothesis, well, yes, in general, it, it performs better for, for mother tongue, though not as worse for a second language data as we have feared. And the normalization of the second hypothesis, normalization does improve uh, performance, even though sometimes pretty marginal, marginally. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I, no. I think you'll be again presenting or not? Not. Uh, used to, yeah. or, okay. Welcome, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yusuf, together with uh, Ariel and Elena, I will be presenting. I will be presenting annotation management tool. Actually, annotation and management are two tools. Actually, it is integrated inside the Swell portal. Before moving into like Swell portal itself, like how the data we collected how, and how the annotation tool works, I want to talk a little bit about Swell itself. Actually, self Swell in infrastructure. Next slide, please. Okay, on this, uh, there is a link to the website like where the self infrastructure project is there. There you can know more about the project. But Swell is like a, a research infrastructure project. And uh, the main reason to have this one is to collect like a L2 data, data set for Swedish actually. And why did uh, we do that? Because like uh, there was a lacking of Swedish L2 data set in uh, our platform actually and the second reason why is also because many researchers and teachers they want to analyze the data and to also see like what is the missing part actually based on like the learners they come from different like first language like different like gender and like what is the level and to improve like the level of standard actually this is one reason also like why we created like the yale 2 data set for swedish uh, Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is how like uh, the Swell portal looks actually. The Swell portal is divided into two parts. One is the data collection, where the metadata and the SS are collected, and the second is the data management tool, where different tasks are performed actually. So, next slide, please. Okay, data collection. How did we collect the data? Actually, data, because we were focusing on uh, Swedish learner data set and to collect like Swedish learner data set we got in contact with like many schools in Sweden and also the universities if they can share their data actually and once they agree to share the data we ask them if we can get the essays and like the metadata information so metadata is information is like where schools uh, school ID like student information task and the essay itself and the, the essays are either like the raw text or the XML format uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is some of the attributes like of different metadata that we collected and we added into the data set. So where there is a source like the name of the school ID and like name and also like uh, we didn't like really collect like personal information about the student like name like where the student came from but mostly like gender and like the age interval. And uh, this is how the metadata in our database looks. Next slide, please. And uh, once we collected, once we inserted the metadata, the next part is to do like the import, like the text itself actually. And uh, text is like either the raw text that is on the left side or the XML text. And once this data is imported, then we go to the data management. Next slide, please. Can you come to the conclusion, please, in the next few sentences? Yeah, I will. Uh, I don't see the next slide. Uh, okay. Uh, finally, what we do in the data management is like first we anonymize the data because according to GDPR rule we can't share the data we can't use for research and then we normalize and then we finally do the correction annotation. And once everything is done, we do like in the final like export the data like uh, in different file formats based on like whether someone wants like anonymize or normalize all the correction annotation data. Yeah. 
so this is what I can say. Like, if there is any question, then I can answer later on Slack or like on the chat. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Let's move to the third and last uh, presentation of this session about uh, not this time uh, a management tool, a notation, but about a lexical acquisition tool. Please. Uh, my name is Danen, and on behalf of my team, I will present our corpus tool, Alexia. Can you go to the next slide, please? There has been some momentum in the development of Icelandic language technology recently as a result of a government-funded program. All of the resulting data and language resources have been or will be made openly available on the Icelandic Clarin repository. The tool we present here can facilitate compilation and expansion of lexical resources by automating the process of detecting data gaps. Additionally, Alexia can be useful when conducting sociolinguistic research, showing when certain words came foothold in the language and how their use can fluctuate depending on what's happening in society. The most recent example of this is the pandemic-related vocabulary. Alexia is designed to be used with the Icelandic Geekaward corpus, uh, which is the largest available text corpus in Icelandic today. The current version contains approximately 1.6 billion running words of text, tagged and lemmatized using automatic methods, and it is in constant expansion. It is therefore very beneficial to have a tool specifically designed for this corpus. However, Alexia is not limited to the Icelandic Geekaward corpus, as it can be used with any plain text corpus as well. Uh, next slide, please. Alexia is run through the terminal, but we try to guide the user as much as possible using step-by-step -step instructions where the user needs to indicate whether to use the entire corpus or only a subsection of it, whether or not to exclude proper names from the results, etc. To showcase the tool's potential, our default settings involve comparing one of two well-known Icelandic language resources to the Icelandic Gigaword corpus. However, if the user settings are selected, any word list and plain text corpus can be selected and compared. Alexia then applies filters to the resulting word list, excluding words that include illegal symbols, are too short, or have certain part of speech tags, such as emails and websites, particles, numerals, etc. Additionally, approximately 60,000 word, uh, stop words are filtered from the results. The stop word list was manually collected from the Icelandic Geek Award corpus and includes typos, misspellings, foreign words, OCR errors, obsolete spelling, etc. Next slide, please. After applying these filters, Alexia generates a list of words sorted by frequencies, which the editors of the lexical resource in question can then use to expand or generate their databases. There are several, several options available, which are discussed in detail in our paper, but you can see some of them on the screenshot. The choice depends on the goal of the researchers. For example, showcasing the individual frequencies for the singular and plural form of a noun can indicate if a word only exists in either one. And additionally, it can help us identify lemmatization errors. An example of this is the Icelandic word lög, which means law, as in law and order. In this context, the word is only ever used in the plural, but the automatic lemmatization process usually lemmatizes it as a singular lag, which means a song or a layer. Next slide, please. Like I already talked about, the main goal of Alexia is to facilitate the creation and expansion of lexical resources using the Icelandic Geekaward corpus, not least in relation to the National Language Technology Program. Like all other resources resulting from the program, Alexia is available on Clarin IS and on GitHub with an open license so anyone interested can modify the code to fit their own needs. It is our hope that Alexia will be a useful automation tool for editors and researchers so their work can be made quicker and easier. In the future, we hope to expand the available output formats even further, for example, making it possible to generate a graph showcasing the timeline of a word's popularity throughout a time period. Additionally, we aspire to create a graphical user interface in order to make the, make the experience even more streamlined for Alexia's users. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>